been on a little adventure. Anything happened to you guys' lives uh, the last three months? <laughs> <laughs> I really wasn't sick this time either, but surgery does that to you. And uh, I'm not going to describe it. I'm not going to say where they all went, uh, all they, or even what they found. You know. <laughs> but um, Monday, the doctor said I can re-enter my uh, normal life. <laughs> so where's that? Dang! <laughs> Who wants that? <laughs> I was hoping there'd be good news, Doc. But, uh, anyway, so the funny thing is that, uh, um, so I, the scripture for this morning is Isaiah 40, um, which is very familiar for you who have ever been through Advent times. Um, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. That her sins have been paid for, she received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground will become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. This is, uh, for me, a very um, profound um, passage as we prepare for uh, God breaking into the world in a radical way at Christmas, uh, entering into our lives and our, uh, and, our, and our whole world. And whenever I look at this passage, which over the years, I've, I've actually preached on this in a few Advent services, and uh, I'm always struck with the fact that, that God has some excavating to do in our life, right? The, the, he needs to bulldoze some things, prop up some things, level out some, and then I thought, oh my gosh, that's what happened to me inside uh, during the surgery. <laughs> and then I got really afraid because this, the excavation was pretty good, and I thought, well, that's, uh, that's what needs to happen inside us and, uh, and outside us and all around us. And God needs to come in and prepare so that we're ready to receive his gift of love as Jesus enters into our life and into our world in a, in a profound and radical way. So, um, I know Christmas is a peppy time for most of you. And so this week, uh, I think it was Wednesday, um, I was uh, asked to do a radio interview in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania. I didn't mention what the Seahawks did uh, to the Steelers. <laughs> I kept my guard up. And, uh, but so I was supposed to be on for 45 minutes uh, talking about the dread of Christmas. And why would they pick on me to do that? <laughs> like, all the people in the country can talk about things. Why do they go for me? Oh, let's get Westfall to talk about the dread of Christmas. <laughs> So, 101.5 on the FM dial in, in uh, Pittsburgh. I was like, and the, the first 15 minutes were great. You know, they, we talked about the from getting past what you'll never get over book, and, and we talked about how, you know, family stuff and this much, or all the things that I'm kind of expert in, depression, just, you know, <laughs> disappointment, frustration. We went through all those things. And then I said, okay, we're going to go to commercial break. We'll be right back with Dr. Westfall, uh, talk some more about this. And they came back from the commercial, and as they came in from commercial, they said the words that radio guests hate. You know, we're going to go to our lines right now, and you can call in, and if you've got a question, you can bring that to Dr. Westfall. You're going to go, oh, man. They, here's, the, here's the rule, okay? And, and Randy Roll and I did a, a radio show for 13, 14 years here in town uh, called Everyday People on Cairo, and uh, we learned that people who call into radio shows are wacky. <laughs> they, are, they are on the wacky side of the stick. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. normal people don't call in. So, all of a sudden, we come back from commercial break, and this show that we were looking forward to doing, and I was prepared for, and talking about all these things, 
suddenly derailed and ran off a cliff like a bunch of drunk <laughs> buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole show went crap. These people in Pittsburgh have issues. <laughs> and, uh, I gotta tell you, and uh, we spent the next half hour talking about. You know, what's going on in the world and terrorism and stress and strife and politics and they even mentioned a few Republican candidates and <laughs> you know, all they even mentioned no Democratic candidate. Yeah, they, all, everything was thrown in there. And uh, my little family dysfunction, phew, right out the window. <laughs> you know, but um, anyways, they're all talking and, and pretty soon we were talking about fear. Isn't that weird? We were talking about fear inside, around us, uh, what's going on uh, in our country, in the world, and, and and then it dawned on me, about halfway into this segment, when people are afraid, they get angry. They're angry. And, um, and then they want to know what I'm going to do about it. You know, forget that. I'm, I'm hanging up in a few minutes. You guys know me in life. But, um, but I hadn't connected that before. There's so much anger around because we're fearful. And we want to we want to fight back to whatever it is that's hurting us and or might hurt us and the threat of it. And, and where we want the people around us to fight back. We want to come at this thing with strength. We want to fix this stuff. Who's going to fix it best and finest and first? And I felt like, oh my gosh, what am I watching here? Well, this whole thing kind of unraveled. And then I realized it, um, and, and it struck me actually during the radio interview, and I, and I said to one caller who was flip side of crazy, you know, <laughs> I said, you know, what you're describing sounds so much like that first Christmas. It is so much like that first Christmas. You're railing about government leaders and officials and politicians, and I'm going, you know, they're talking about talk about dysfunctional government leaders. You know, let's kill all the babies. You know, <laughs> and uh, and you're talking about things going on in the world and threats and. People are supposed to protect us or pushing us around and try to control us and everything. Nobody's standing up for it. Uh, and uh, I went, that is just like the world that Jesus entered. No surprise there. It wasn't like Jesus was born in the world and God went, oh, dang, this is the wrong time. <laughs> Look at all those problems these people have. Let's wait until... 2015. <laughs> yeah, whatever they do. No, might as well come in now because it's not going to be much different. So I go back to this uh, passage and I think about what is it that God wants us to do? First of all, He wants us to bring a message of comfort. Comfort is not, oh, it's all going to be okay. Remember, we've talked about this many times. Comfort, the word comfort means to come alongside and make strong. To strengthen. When we comfort someone, we, we give them the, the, the strength to go forward. To go on. To, to the strength to trust God in their situation. The strength to, to have hope for, that things can be different and better. And, and, that, and that life's not over for them. And that God still has something for them. That's, that's what comfort is. When you comfort somebody, that you don't walk away and they feel weaker. And so you walk away and they feel stronger to go forward. I think I can, I can trust God now. And so that's what, what the message we have to bring. And then it says, you know, God wants some excavation done. Now, it's the voice of one. I always thought as a kid, you know, Sunday school and everything, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, right? That's the way I always thought of it. The problem is that's not what it says. It's a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Okay. 
in the desert, preparing the way of the Lord. And I think about that and I go, boy, you know, there's dry places in my life. Uh, I became painfully aware of it. I used, I like to hide in relationships, you know, a lot of people around me, and preferably superficial, shallow ones, you know, because uh, the deeper relationships have issues. But, um, <laughs> But, uh, so I like to have a lot of people in my life. So I'm about three months of isolation, like living in a cave. And it's just kind of me and the Lord and the dysfunctional dog. <laughs> Maggie, she's got a personality disorder. <laughs> like everything else around me. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I'm there and, and I go, what do I do when I'm not hiding in relationships with people? When I'm not part of the crowd. Um, that's, uh, I discovered that that's kind of a desert there in which, uh, in that desert, I need to prepare the way for the Lord. <laughs> I need to let God do some work for me. I need to find a way. What is it that I'm using to block God's love from coming to my life? What, what defense mechanisms do I have in place so that when Jesus enters our world as a gift of love from God uh, to transform me and all of us and our whole world, what defenses do I have to make sure I'm not changed? In the desert, I need to prepare a way for the Lord. And, uh, and I realize I've got some uh, rough ground that's going to have to be left. Um, that rough ground and rugged places that I've endured and probably cultivated for decades. And, and God wants me to give that up so that I'm not defensive about his love to me. Um, you know, I, I looked over at though. This probably should be saved for Christmas Eve, but too bad. Um, it, I was looking at Matthew chapter 1, you know, about the birth of Jesus. And I've always thought, you know, isn't that great when the, when the angels came to the shepherds and they said, don't be afraid. You know, because the shepherds were obviously nervous. <laughs> and uh, don't be afraid. We bring you good news and great joy, right? And I was, I was kind of hung up. <clears throat> then I, I went and looked at the Bible. Whoa. So, <laughs> in Matthew 1, birth of Jesus, um, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, Joseph, do not be afraid. <clears throat> and then over to Luke. I know the Christmas story's in the front of Luke. <laughs> Went to Mary. How about this? Luke uh, chapter 1. Mary was greatly troubled. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. And then... Zechariah, waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the Messiah. And he's told, don't be afraid. And then the shepherds, don't be afraid. And I realized, I think the only person who wasn't told by God to not be afraid was King Herod. <laughs> and this whole thing, it says he was agitated, he was he was frustrated, he was uh, wondering what's going on when the you know the foreign visitors came and uh, uh, told him that they were looking for the new king and that got him all upset. God didn't say to him, "Don't be afraid." The only one. Everybody else in the story, don't be afraid. Now, remember back to the radio show talk we were having how everybody was afraid and, and they seemed to be just angry about everything. I want you to know something. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say, don't be angry. No, the messengers of God don't come here and say, oh, okay, now, just be nice, you know, be happy, be happy in face, you know. 
Uh, don't 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 be upset. Don't be frustrated. Don't be angry. Don't don't be whatever it is that's going on. Now my family we got that a lot, but never from God, never from uh, the Bible. Because the problem is never our anger. The problem is always our fear. And if we're going to be strengthened, if we're going to hear a word of comfort, if we're going to hear uh, what God wants to do in us and how he wants to prepare us to receive his gift of love this Christmas, we need to hear, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God can speak into our life when we're angry. It's very difficult to speak into our life when we're afraid. when we're afraid maybe maybe I'm alone in this but when I get afraid <laughs> when I start worrying about something when I get agitated about something when I start thinking blah, 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 then um, my tendency maybe I'm alone in this is to try and get things under control why did I always go to that if I'm, if I'm afraid about something going on in my family, I try and control them all. I've tried to control the crazy dog, but that doesn't help. It's <laughs> nothing. That dog's angry, too. <laughs> but um, but um, I always go to that. That's my first thing. We can fix this. We can stop that. We can handle this. And so when my health disappeared three months ago, it was the first Sunday of... October, I was sitting back there with Jane, and I remember feeling like something was going on wrong in me. And I leaned over, I don't know if you remember this, Jane, but I leaned over and I said, I think my body is shutting down. And uh, she said something wise like, well, you need to relax more or something. <laughs> 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 you know, but um, I, that, was what, that was the first clue was when I was sitting there, I went, something terribly wrong. I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I'm shutting down. And it was that night that Damien dragged me into the car and took me to the hospital. Um, I was in a situation for three months. I need to tell you this. I had absolutely no control. You know, I went to Swedish hospital for this surgery. And you know, they're prepping it for surgery. I thought that's when I gave them instructions. <laughs> but, you know, it's preparation time. It's prep time, right? This is when I tell them, okay, the doctor comes to see you a little quickly, a little smile and everything, and there's the nurses around stuff. And, and the anesthesiologist said, just before you go, 99, nine. <laughs> Just before then, that's when you say, okay, here's what I want you to do, guys. This is how it's going to work. This is, I know, don't deviate from my plan. You know. Do you know they didn't even ask me? They didn't even care what I wanted them to do. Martin Luther, an interesting insight. The sin underneath all of our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ. The lie is that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and must take matters into our own hands. That's the sin beneath all sins. If we trusted the love and the grace of Jesus, why would we need to take matters into our own hands? We belong to him. We're in his loving hands, right? But the sin underneath all of our sins is the fear that we can't trust him. We need to hear comfort. We need, we need to, to hear can't trust. We 
can trust Christ. We can trust that God plans good for us. We can trust even when, uh, like in my case, my health is spiraled out of control. Um, we can trust uh, when our relationships get a little hinky and our always <laughs> makes that happen. We can trust when we're grieving and, and, and when the loss is too great for us so we don't know how if we can even breathe anymore. And all of these things, we can, we can trust that we don't have to take matters into our own hands. We can let, let God love us this Christmas. The excavation that, that in Isaiah 40 talks about the, the craggy places made love, all those things. That none of that is about us working hard to get it together so that we'll finally have it together this Christmas when Jesus is born in the manger. And so we can go into the next year confident because we've got it all under control. That's not what it is. In fact, the preparation, the excavation, the work that God wants to do in us, in all of us, uh, is to get us to a point where we can receive the love and care and comfort of the Lord. Without deflecting it, without avoiding it, without doing that matrix bin thing, you know, <laughs> so God's grace goes right by us without touching us. Sorry, that was a reference to old movie. You know, <laughs> we'll strike it from this video. So, um, it's all just to get us ready to receive it. How do we do that? I want to receive Christ's love. I, I should take matters into my own hands so that I know. Well, I want I want to experience God's love. I want to be able to trust Him this year. So I better. Get to work. No. What do we do? I was wondering that this week. What is it that we do? I, I couldn't find a way to... And then I came across this uh, from Desmond Tutu. Like when you sit in front of a fire in winter. You're just there in front of the fire. You don't even have to be smart <laughs> or anything. The fire warms you. Yeah, that's what it is. We don't have to get it together. We don't have to take matters into our own hands. We don't have to protect God's reputation. We don't have to do anything like that. All we have to do is sit by the fire, and let the warmth of God's love and care and mercy and peace warm us. Just receive it. That's my challenge for me and for all of us this, this Christmas. Let's let God warm us with his love, with his mercy, trust that to be enough. Will you do that with me? <coughs> Lord Jesus, come. Come into our hearts. Come into our lives. Come and warm us. We confess that we've done the sin of trying to take things into our own hands because we don't trust you. We don't trust your love and mercy. But Lord, Today we choose to. And give us the strength and the courage to choose to tomorrow as well. Maybe even Tuesday. Maybe every day. Lord, give us the courage not to lash out because we're afraid. Let's just let you warm us in your grace. That's our prayer. That's our need today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.